been called to re reconcile the world back to God. But not only does he do that, as you read this, Peter says, these men are not drunk as you suppose. Have you ever been so uh, filled with the Holy Spirit? So filled with the Holy Spirit that uh, it appears as if you have lost your mind, that you're drunk. Have you ever been there? Maybe you've not. There are some people right now that when they get filled with the Holy Spirit, some of them shout uncontrollably. Some people pass out. We used to call it back in the old days, slain in the Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit comes, the people at this time thought these people, that these apostles that were in the upper room, they thought that they were drunk. And Peter had to stand up and say, listen, we want you not to know that the people you see here are not drunk, but they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter says something else. He says that in verse number 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a very important statement because there are some people who believe that everybody is going to heaven. That if you're a good person, you immediately are going to heaven. I want you to know that uh, there, there are certain conditions that must be met in order to go to heaven. And the Bible tells us those conditions. Who knows the conditions that must be met in order to go to, go to heaven? Romans 10, 9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You cannot go to heaven unless you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm sorry. Good people... You can be as good as you want to be, but don't know Jesus and bust wide hell wide open. Anybody want to say something about that? You can serve the church all your life. Be a trustee, a usher, a member of the church, cook fried chicken every Wednesday and Thursday, and still bust hell wide open. There are going to be a lot of good folk going to hell. Hello. A lot of folk who did good things going to hell. But Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello. You've got to make that confession with your mouth. The Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 10, 9. And believe in your heart that God has raised them from the dead, you will be saved. And then it goes on to say in verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Don't miss it. You can only believe with your heart. And with your heart, when you believe, when you believe, you are justified. This justified means that you are made right with God. You cannot be made right with God unless you go through Jesus. Are you with me? You must go through Jesus. I know that's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? There are some folk that, who believe that the way to God is through Muhammad. There are others who believe that just by doing good works, serving in the church and paying your tithes and offerings, you can hook up with Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can hook up with God. I, 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 I hate to bust your bubble, 
but with your mouth you profess him, but with your heart you believe him. It's easy to profess him with your mouth and not believe with your heart. A lot of folk, when they were children, professed Jesus with their mouth, but they never believed in the heart. Y'all pray with me? And I come to tell you that when you believe in the heart, how do you know you believe in your heart? Because your life's changed. When you believe in the heart, then your faith is increased. So when we talk about you being justified, it is by faith alone that you're justified. Look at Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says that therefore, since we have been justified through our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You ain't made right because you fried some chicken. You ain't made right because you gave out food at the food pantry. You did a good work. You are made right when you are justified by your faith and your faith in Jesus Christ. Being an AKA ain't going to put you in heaven. Being a Delta ain't going to put you in heaven. The AKAs do good work. Deltas do good work. Uh, alphas do good work. But doing the work of the AKA and the Delta ain't going to put you in heaven. It is only when you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Hello, I, I, I know, and don't get me wrong, I wanted to be an Alpha for a long time. And can I tell you, can I, can I tell y'all a little story about being an Alpha? Y'all got time to hear my story. Y'all don't want to hear the story, do you? Yeah. Uh, I don't think you want to hear this story. I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm going to tell you why I'm not an alpha today. I profess that I want to be an alpha. I believe that I was going to be an alpha. I ain't going to tell y'all this story because y'all can't handle it. You know what? If you want to hear the story about what happened with me being an alpha, I'm going to encourage you to come to church on one of these Sundays, and I'm going to tell the story. It's going to shock you. It's going to blow your mind. What I'm trying to say to you, that being an alpha, I love you, brothers. Being a, a sigma, I love you, brothers. Being in the band fraternity, I love you, brothers and sisters. Will not get you into heaven. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified, have been justified, guess what? You were justified when Jesus Christ died on that cross. And the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you accept him through your faith, immediately you are made right with God. And my daddy used to say it like this, that God takes our sins and throw it into the sea of forgetfulness and post a sign out there and says, no fishing. Mm. I come to tell you that all the wrong that I've done in my life, God has forgiven me and he has justified me. And since I've been justified through my faith, this is what Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Before I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was like Paul. We were enemies of God. Now let me tell you something. You do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, don't you? Huh? Y'all believe that? Now tell me, who is the bride of Christ? Who is the bride of Christ? Okay, the church is the bride of Christ. Y'all believe that? The, the church is the bride of Christ. Y'all really believe that? I think y'all believe that. I believe you believe that. If the church is the bride of Christ, if you don't like the church, if you don't like Christ's bride, how can you like Christ? There are a lot of folk who say they love God but don't like the church. 
And I want to know, how can you not like the church but love God? I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to, through 23. You'll find that after the book of Galatians. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. You got it? Now, this is one a lot of folk, a lot of married folk don't like this. A lot of wives don't like this. Can I, can, can I go ahead and put it out there for you? It says, wives, submit your own, your own husbands. Submit to your own husband. Hello. As to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, 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 I know somebody's about to get mad at me. As Christ, check it out, is the head of the church. His body and is himself is Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, oh, I'm sorry, wives, y'all ain't going to like the Bible. We're talking about biblical stuff. We ain't talking about this Dr. Spock stuff. So also wives should submit in everything. Don't let me get started. In everything to their husband. Now, now, now we ain't gonna, we ain't gonna get on relationship. But I'm just that text is used to show how the church is the bride of Christ. And if you don't like the bride of Christ, then how can you have fellowship with Christ? And so when we go back to Acts chapter 2, am I, am I talking too much, y'all? Y'all tell me if I'm talking too much. Mm -mm. When we go back to Acts chapter 2, verse number 21, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is more than just calling on the name of the Lord. But then you have to go to Romans and figure out if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that Christ is raised from the dead, you shall be saved. And then you got to go on to that next text that says that with, that with your, uh, that with your heart you believe, you're justified that way, but with your mouth you profess. And I submit to you that there are a lot of folk right now who say they believe in God, but don't act like they believe in God. Mm. There are a lot of folk who say they have faith in God, but don't show their faith. Well, Reverend, how can you say that? Because you won't pay your tithes and offers. Ooh. How can you say that? Because you won't come out and volunteer. How can you say that? Because anytime the pastor says something that offends you, you're ready to take your ball and go home. Why you say that? Your works determine where your faith is. Now, 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 now I know some of y'all gonna get mad at the preacher man today. <laughs> huh? Because there are a lot of folk who say they got faith. But the Bible says the only thing you need is the faith the size of, of a mustard seed. But I just want to know where is your faith? Where is your faith? Hmm. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6, 21. I'm going to show you one way you can figure out where your faith is. You got your Bibles? Turn to Matthew chapter 6. This is Bible study. And now some might be saying, well, why do you turn to all them scriptures? Because we're in Bible study. And if you're going to be in Bible study, you ought to at least see a lot of people just want to use a book. And uh, that's going to be our Bible study. No, let's go to the Bible. 
That's what we're here to study. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse number 21. This is one way you can figure out where your faith is. Y'all got it? Look at what Jesus says. This is Jesus talking. He's talking about lay up your, your treasures in heaven. Look at what he says in verse number 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where mouth, mouth, uh, mouth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Check this out. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. If your treasure represents the things that you value, the things that you value is where you're going to put your money. I, I know I'm stepping on somebody's toe. I can, I can hear it. I can hear somebody saying out. I said out to myself. Because when the treasure belongs to God, then that's where your money going to be. That's where your tithe going to be. And don't get me wrong, there are times when it's tight. But God is saying that all of this is related. You say, well, how does that relate to Acts? If whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Once you save, not only is your heart saved, not is your mouth, not only is your mouth saved, but your checkbook is saved. The way you deal with your husband and your wife is saved. The way you relate to your children will reflect salvation. And you can't tell me you saved, but you still cussing folk out. You can't tell me you saved, but you still on the phone gossiping. Now, now wait a minute. I can't judge your salvation. Y'all do know that, don't you? No preacher can judge your salvation. I can't tell you you're going to heaven or hell. Y'all with me? Because the truth of the matter is I got a lot of sin in me. And if you saw all the sin that was in me, you would say, I'm not saved. But what you can judge, y'all ready? I'm going to tell you what you can judge. You can't judge if, I, if my salvation But you know what you can judge, Bible students? You can judge my works. Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 6, or chapter 7, verse 16 through 20. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit, right? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is thrown down and cast into the fire. Now check this out. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, I can't judge whether you are saved, but I can judge your fruit. And so, if you're walking around cussing folk out every day, I can't say that you ain't saved. But I can say that's some bad fruit. If you see Reverend Hudson, that's why I try to keep my sins secret between <laughs> me and the Lord. Y'all understand that? You ought not tell everybody all your sins. John Wesley, the great writer John Wesley, let me tell you what he tried to do. He sat down and wrote all of his sins. And every time he conquered one sin, guess what happened? He found out he had another sin. And just when he conquered that sin, what happened? He found out that he had another sin. 
And so the more he tried to become perfect, the more he realized that he was a sinner and that he could not be perfect. Now, I know the Bible says, be ye perfect as I am perfect. And that text is talking about being perfect in the way we love one another. But Paul recognized that. And guess what he said? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to help somebody. Somebody turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 24. We're still talking about being saved, y'all. And we're still dealing with Acts. But when you talk about salvation, you've got to realize that even though you saved, it doesn't mean that you ain't going to sin. In fact, before I got here, I almost sinned on purpose. See, there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. The sins of commission are the sins you willingly do. And then the sins of omission are the sins that you have no idea that you're doing. Am I talking too much, y'all? Tell me. I want you to turn to, turn to Romans chapter 7. And I want you to look at, let's start at verse number 14. Y'all ready? I'm going to read it to you. Am I, uh, if I'm going too long, y'all got to forgive me. But I get excited when I get into this word. Look at what Paul writes to the Romans. And if you know about the Romans, they had all kind of worshiping going on. And there were some who were trying to uh, bring some of the worshiping that was going on outside of Christianity and to the Christian faith. But look at what verse 14 says in Romans chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. This is Paul. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Anybody ever done that? Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So when I do and obey the cravings of my flesh, it's not I who's doing it. It's the sin that is in me because the flesh wants to please itself. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Do you realize that right now? That as long as you're in your flesh, there's nothing good in your flesh. I don't care how far. Listen, you can be fine as homemade wine. I mean, fine as homemade wine and still be corrupt. For I have the to do what is right, but not the ability, check it out, to carry it out. That's why when we look at the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes in us, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to carry it out. Check it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Look at verse number 20. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Check it out. I'm not talking too much. Y'all got to forgive me. Look at what he said. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Y'all ever been there? You want to do right? You say, look, I said I ain't going to stop by another McDonald's. I swear for cheese. I said I ain't going to eat enough. January 1, every year. December 31, every year, I, I make the same problem. I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year. And I start off doing good. I get tempted. Just like temp Jesus was tempted by the devil, I get tempted. And I pass by that McDonald's. Now listen, the sin is not my temptation. It ain't sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted by the devil. You know when the sin happens? I'm going to give you a verse for that in a minute. It's when you yield to the temptation. Paul says, I want to do right, but evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members, and when he says members, he's talking about his flesh. 
another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my flesh. And then he says, these Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? As long as you're in this body, you are in a body of death because your flesh wants to sin. That's why in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up and says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when God saves you, Jesus told him, I want you to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes. It fills them up. They start acting like they're drunk. But what they don't know is that this Holy Spirit is going to give them the power so that when the enemy comes and tells them what they can't do, they can be like Barack Obama and say, yes, I can. And that's what you got to understand. Y'all praying with me? I hope I didn't bore y'all. <laughs> because a lot of us are at the place where we think that because we committed a few sins that God has forsaken us. I want you to turn to James chapter 1, verse 14. Y'all write these Bible verses down, aren't you? I want you to turn to James 1, 14. Now, let's start at James chapter 1, verse 12. Are y'all still on the prayer line, the Bible line? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm about to, this is going to be our last verse. Because every time I give y'all verse, I go into another subject. But we're still talking, we're still talking about Acts chapter 2. And all of this is under the heading of what it means to be saved. Y'all understand? Have I given y'all too much? No. Okay, y'all let me know. Are y'all confused about what I'm talking about today? No, it's not. Okay, I'm parachuting all over the place. <laughs> but I'm parachuting to let you know that what's going on in Acts chapter 2 helps us to deal with all this other stuff that surrounds us because We'll get to the place where we start feeling defeated because you got the Holy Ghost, but you still sinning. And I'm going to tell you now, you show me one preacher that say he don't sin no more, I'm going to show you a liar. All right? And let me tell you, even the 80 and 90 year old sin, the only reason why they ain't doing what some of us young preachers do because they're too old a little bit. Don't be mad at me. Did I say something bad? Y'all got to forgive me. I ain't no good. Well, you know, uh, 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 some of the older brothers and some of the senior sisters. Now, let's be real. Some of you senior sisters, y'all still, y'all still got that burning. It ain't, it ain't left you. Age does not, does not take away the burn. That's that. I don't care how old you get, there's something you deal with. Y'all got to forgive me. I know I have been bad this morning. I have been bad this morning. I have not been godly. I done talked about the older brothers because I'm getting there. You know, uh, you know, I remember my daddy saying this one day and my, my mother died and you know, he's 70 something years old. He ain't old. 70 something ain't old and 80 ain't either. But uh, he, he just sees it. And so uh, he decided that he going up and get married. Uh -oh. and, I, and, 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 you know, I, you know, I wasn't ready for my dad to get married. My mother died. You, and I'm saying to dad, you're too old to get me getting married. Uh-oh. Well, he told you, didn't he? 
Uh, and, and then he huh? said, he looked at me. You know, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna never forget it. Dad, you, I hope you ain't listening because uh, I'm, a, I'm telling a story. Uh, so he, he, he showed me the lady that was chasing. She was chasing him. I mean, chasing him like he was a, t like he had taken care of them gold, just chasing him. And uh, I had never seen him. And so one day. I was sitting there and said, son, that's, that's her right there. And I was thinking it was somebody else. And I said, well, you know, I was shaking my head. I was praying for my dad. But then the lady beside him, she was like 35 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, dad, uh, I understand. <laughs> and then, uh, but he said something that, that really was profound. He said, my son, she makes me come alive. And that was profound for me to think that at that age, my father was still alive. And that only means to say that just because you are older doesn't mean that life is over for you. And being older does not mean that you won't be tempted. Because I know some older sisters who get tempted and some older brothers. And I want you to know being tempted is not a sin. Look at, look at what James 1, 12. No, y'all, y'all gonna come back next week. Y'all gonna y'all come back next week. I'll do better. <laughs> Listen, look at what James chapter 1, verse 12 says. It says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trials, because having stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Verse 13 says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Y'all understand that? Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Being tempted is not the sin. The sin is when it becomes full blown. You meditate on it. You think about it day and night. And that's why I tell y'all I see it all the time. Because that's some stuff I've been thinking about day and night. I ain't going to tell you what it is. In fact, when I leave here, I'm thinking about that McDonald's right now. And for me, eating McDonald's is a big sin. I know. And that, that must be Miss Phyllis. Miss Phyllis, I can't help it. Every time I go past McDonald's, and I see the golden arches, and then I can smell those french fries. If I keep on going, I'm okay. But if I stop, then I'm in trouble. I'm about done. I want to get back to Acts 2. Because Acts 2 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, it says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Acts is true. Y'all pray with me? I, I'm trying to to tell you that God is giving you this Holy Spirit and he is giving you the power and when he is giving you this power it becomes your, uh, your, your responsibility to use your power and so when you're tempted you call on the name of the Lord and God will give you the power I'm going to give y'all this last thing. My daddy said it this way. He said, son, you only need three things to be aligned in order for something bad to happen. Y'all ready? The only three things you need for something bad to happen is time, space, and opportunity. 
If you have the time and space but not the opportunity, you're good. If you have the time and opportunity but not the space, you're good. You might have the space and the opportunity but not the time. But when you have the time, the space, and the opportunity, watch out. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody who's got the time, you got the space. You've been thinking about this thing, but you ain't had the opportunity. And what Paul is saying, I'm mean, sorry, what Peter is saying here, that this Holy Spirit, when the time, the space, and the opportunity shows up, that you will have an opportunity to escape it. Because the Holy Spirit will give you the power. Y'all with me? And uh, we're about to end this thing. I hope I didn't stay too long. Uh, I know I got a big mouth. But I wanted to take you back to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And that this will tie it all together. Y'all ready? It's going to tie everything I said together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Period. Y'all got it? So when time, space, and opportunity is made available, you got the power to resist. When you feel lonely and you can't go on, you got the power to say, yes, I can. Even when the devil says, no, I can't. I'm talking to you. Let us pray. So God, we thank you for our time today. We have done what you told us to do. So God, we pray that your spirit will take us now. Help us to withstand the temptations of the devil. Help us to be saved through and through. Our checkbooks, our pocketbooks, our minds, where we go, what we do with our hands, our feet, and our mouth. Help us to truly be saved. We know that we're going to be tempted. We know we're going to fall. But when we fall down, help us to get back up. God, you know what my own temptations are. And I ask you in the name of Jesus that you deliver me from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to end with this song. I want you to hold. That's what this thing is about. Hold the God's unchanging hand. Hello. So those of you who are on Facebook, uh, we hope that this has been a blessing to you, and uh, we pray that uh, as we leave this place, that you don't leave what the core, what the center of this message was really about, and that is that you have the power that when Acts came, you received the power, the church was birthed, but not only that, as an individual, you got the power to say, yes, I can. I'm going to ask now. If our dear sister will 
um, turn the Facebook page off on my tablet 